Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today uh, at today's virtual public meeting on Forging Ahead. First, the MBTA has a presentation. We ask that you please hold all comments until the end of that presentation. Third, we have planned the meeting to go until 8 p.m. tonight. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few meeting controls for folks who are not familiar with Zoom. We will have live language interpretation at today's meeting. I will explain how to select your preferred language now in English. Written instructions are provided on your screen now in Spanish and Chinese. In your meeting webinar controls at the bottom of your screen, please click interpretation. Then click the language that you would like to hear. Even participants listening in English should select English so that you can hear any comments being spoken in other languages. Due to a technical, a, a technical glitch, we ask that if you are looking to get interpretation in Spanish, you click on German. You will, we assure you that you will hear Spanish. Here are a few tips for folks who would like to view the ASL interpreter at all times. First, keep your view settings in gallery mode. It should be the default setting. You can change this by clicking the bottom that says, the button that says gallery mode. In the top right of your screen, gallery mode shows all, present, all presenters on your screen together. This ensures you can see the interpreter as well as the speaker. Before we move on, I'd like to make a quick, a quick amendment to, an, to my earlier comment about Spanish. Cantonese is, the, is, is uh, what we're having a bit of an issue with, and please click German if you would like to hear uh, the language interpretation in Cantonese. If a presenter is sharing slides, view all the view that we will, the view will change. You will, your screen will primarily display the slides with the presenters and interpreters video, and, and interpreters video moving to be small on the top right corner. Often the default setting will show only the speaker, not the ASL interpreter. To change this, you can pin the interpreter's video. To do this, click the ellipses on the top right corner of the interpreter's video and select pin video. You will need to repeat this process each time to switch interpreters. The ESL interpreters expect to switch approximately every 20 minutes. Next slide, please. We also have closed captions for this meeting. By default, subtitles should be appearing on the bottom of your screen. If you do not see the captions, please press the closed caption button to get them started. Next slide, please. Following the presentation, we will first answer clarifying questions and then open the floor for comments and testimonials. If you have any clarifying questions, please type them into the chat pod during, the following, during or following the presentation. If you have any questions on using the Zoom platform, you may use the chat, you may use the chat to the MBTA tech support to help, us res to help you resolve any issues you may have. Again, I'd like to remind folks, uh, uh, due to an earlier uh, 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 technical issue, the Cantonese is German today. Please click on that. And now, I like in today's call. We are joined today by Secretary Pollack as well as uh, as well as Director Lang. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge any elected officials that are here with us today or their staff. I'd like to turn it over to Secretary Pollack to get us started and say a few words, Secretary. Thank you very much, Angel. <clears throat> and thank you to everyone who has made time this evening um, to participate in this very important conversation about the MBTA and its service through the process that we've been calling Forging Ahead. Um, before I turn this over to Eric Stutthoff from the MBTA Chief Engineer's Office to make his presentation, I just wanna make a few overview points. First and perhaps most importantly, I do want to emphasize that the MBTA is not doing this because we want to reduce service. We are doing this because um, we need to reduce service. Um, the T has been working um, for the, all of the years that I've been secretary 
to improve service, to provide better service to its customers, to increase its capital spending to make the system better. But because of the pandemic, the number of people who are using the MBTA has dropped a lot. And the amount of fair revenue that the T can collect from those folks, as well as related revenue like parking, has also dropped. Just to give you an example, which I know Eric will repeat, we're providing about the same service as we were a year ago for 1.3 million riders, but there are only 330,000 people a day using the system. While we understand that service cuts are difficult, it is not the best use of the money from taxpayers, local communities, or those of you who ride the system and pay fares to run buses or trains or ferries that are empty or nearly empty. And that is where the focus of this process is. Um, the MBTA has designed this process to protect our most essential services and our most vulnerable riders and the riders who depend on the T. And while we've done our best to define what those most important services are, we um, are holding these public meetings in order to get feedback and we will take it very seriously. That's why I'm here to listen. That's why Director Lang is here directly to listen and to um, use the information we gather from these public hearings to make changes if we have the resources available and if we have not done our job in drawing the line between service that we need to be continuing and service that we can dial back on. Uh, last two points that I just want to make and then I'll turn it over to Eric. The service changes um, do not take effect immediately, so you do not need to worry if a service that you use regularly is being considered for changes. Um, they will be phased in um, during 2021 with commuter rail service perhaps starting as early as January, but most of the changes on the subways and the buses would not occur till spring or summer. The services, the changes are not permanent. They're not intended to be permanent. The T is committed to bringing back higher level of services as ridership reemerges and as there is revenue to support it. Um, and so I just want to reassure folks that that means because we're not making the service changes immediately, if things change, if revenue becomes available, if ridership starts to go up faster, um, the, the T will be monitoring its ridership during 2021. Um, and then the last thing I would just say is we, we don't take making service changes lightly. It is not the first thing the T is doing. Tens of millions of dollars are being saved from the budget from expense cuts that are not related to service provision. Cutting service is a last resort, but we have a responsibility to spend your dollars wisely and to make sure that we're investing in the service that riders are using right now or will start using shortly and not invest in the service that was important at this time last year, but isn't being used today. So thank you for um, participating tonight. I look forward to listening to your feedback and now I will turn it over to Eric. Thank you, Secretary. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, I wanna recognize that uh, FMCB Director Crystal Cornegay has, uh, has also joined to, to listen to the testimony and clarifying questions from the public. Uh, my name is Eric Studhoff. I'm the Chief Engineer for the MBTA, and um, I'm here to walk through uh, the, the work that the MBTA has been doing is really since the pandemic um, has, has taken hold and we've really been able to identify some of the, uh, some of the budget challenges that, uh, that we see ourselves in uh, in the wake of, of the pandemic. Um, it's, uh, it, we, we've coined it as forging ahead and, uh, and what forging ahead really is, is a, a three-pronged effort to look internally within the MBTA to identify areas where we can uh, reduce our costs uh, either through the, the reduction of internal expenses, the reallocation or delay or redistribution of some of our limited capital program funds, to support our operating expenses. And then lastly, as a, as a last re resort, uh, reducing some service levels to, uh, to, to our service area. Now, these, these are really only reductions that we've taken as a last resort after we've exhausted our, our other two opportunities 
within within the organization to look at our capital uh, expenditures and our internal operating expenditures. Uh, the intent of this effort is to uh, really preserve the most essential services that uh, that are critical to the region and critical to uh, provide those res those resources and services for our most transit critical population. Uh, so as we are going through this very difficult situation, uh, we are looking to be flexible to, uh, to, to the conditions that we see as we, as we progress through the next uh, several months and, and possibly even years. And as we recover out of the, out of the pandemic and are able to uh, restore some service, we do so considering some of the transformational operations that we've been studying for the past several years, as the secretary mentioned in our opening, namely the bus network redesign and the rail transformation. So as we are helping the economy recover, we are doing so consistent with what our strategies have been that we've laid out um, leading up to this point. I want to use this, take this opportunity to, to give a snapshot to the public of the MBTA's operating budget. Um, and, uh, and as you look at this graph and you walk your way from left to right, you see the, the, the various categories that make up our nearly $2.3 billion operating budget. And, uh, and what we are projecting as of right now is, is nearly a $600 million uh, budget gap that, uh, that as a result of, uh, of some of the revenues that we've seen drop off as a result of our lower ridership and, uh, and, and the lack of travel. and and really some of the good work that the public are doing to follow those recommendations as we, as we try to manage the, uh, the pandemic and, and the health crisis that, that we're dealing with. Um, that does amount to about a 25% um, uh, capture of our, of our operating budget. Um, and so what we're projecting for the, uh, the next year, the fiscal 22 year is, uh, is, is something that we're trying to solve through, uh, through use, utilizing the, the levers that I'm going to describe in a minute. So the, as I described in an earlier slide, we are looking at um, the, the, the three levers of looking internally at our programmatic and departmental spending, basically our internal operating budget and, and, and really sharpening any of the expenditures that we can sharpen internal to the organization. And then we are looking at our capital allocation and what are those capital funds that we are utilizing and what, what projects and what capital resources can we delay or can we redistribute to uh, support the critical uh, services that we provide. And then lastly, identifying areas where we are able to make adjustments to our service so that we can try and sustain the, the most critical service that we have uh, that we will be defining later on in our program. This, this graph really walks through the, the, the drop off in ridership that we've seen since the pandemic. And you'll, you'll see the, the, the drop very dramatically uh, in, in the, uh, the middle weeks of, of March of this year. And, uh, and slowly some of, the, uh, some of our ridership has come back. Uh, you'll look at the, uh, at, the, at the slide here and you'll see in yellow and in uh, the dashed gray lines, they, they represent our bus service and our paratransit or ride service as being some of the most robust uh, services that, that have come back along with the blue line rapid transit service that, uh, that is approaching the 40% ridership of pre-COVID, 40% uh, of pre-COVID ridership as we've, as we've seen our, our, uh, our, our service restore. Uh, what we have not seen uh, is dramatic uh, build back of, of ridership on the remainder of our rapid transit network uh, or our commuter rail or ferry service. And those are represented by the colored lines that you see below in their respective colors of orange, red, green, and silver, representing those transit lines. And the blue dotted line represents our ferry service and the purple line represents our commuter rail service. As the secretary mentioned in her opening, uh, we are providing uh, near, nearly the same exact service that we were providing this time last year as we return to uh, regular service. But last year at this time, we were serving nearly 1.3 million uh, trips 
and today we are serving the uh, with the same level of service. We are serving uh, just just about three hundred and thirty thousand trips each day. So, as we plan for this uncertain future, uh, we've gone through and performed several uh, several models uh, where we where we utilize uh, vari variables uh, within those models to to predict what ridership return may look like across our different modes. And we are we we've got wide ranging predictions for what the ridership return will look like over time, and we will we 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 think it will change. Uh, or return to service across the different modes in a very different way. So what we are seeing at, with the models that we're getting best information from is that this is not a six month challenge that we're, that we're working with, but this is uh, greater than a year long challenge that we're, that we're dealing with, where even, even in June of 2022, we are not predicting that we will be near back to 100% of pre-COVID ridership in the best of circumstances. So this is really uh, a long ranging plan that we want to try and put together so that we can support the essential services that we provide. And in the meantime, plan for the different circumstances that could, could, could transpire. And so that when we build back service based on the return of ridership, we're doing so, as I mentioned earlier, consistent with our bus network redesign and our rail transformation programs. I'm seeing in the in the chat here that, uh, that that our technical support folks have asked me to mention that the Spanish language line is up and working for those of you who may have uh, indicated that there is a challenge with the Spanish language channel. So forging ahead is an iterative process. Um, I think one thing that we've all recognized from COVID was that um, we're not really sure what is in the future. Uh, we, are, uh, we, we, are, we are managing this as best we can with the best information we have at the time we have. Uh, but what we, what we are managing to right now is what we think is the most realistic uh, future over the next at least 12 month period, 12 to 18 month period where we are projecting this budget crisis to con continue as, uh, as, as we hopefully are able to uh, recover from the COVID pandemic and return back to service. What we are doing here today is we are going forward through these public meetings. We are seeking your feedback as we present some of these very challenging proposals that, that we have laid out here, uh, which represents some of our best work to uh, identify what we think is the, the, the most uh, efficient and, uh, and, and considered uh, response to, to, to make these service changes that, that unfortunately we do need to present. Uh, to the public. Um, it is, as the Secretary mentioned, not a, a series of changes that will go into effect immediately. In fact, most of these will not go into, into effect for several, uh, several months, probably as, as, as late as, as June timeframe. And then as we identify uh, ridership that returns, we are, we are able to go through our normal program of reevaluating our services on a quarterly or semi-annual basis to evaluate where we might be able to bring back service as, uh, as that service becomes um, more, more robust or the, the ridership needs become more robust and, and require more service. So I'd like to take a moment to talk through uh, what we talk about with uh, transit critical service and essential services. And, uh, and this is reflected, it's a graphic that, that we presented at the board several times, and it's, uh, it's a two by two where we, in the columns, are, are talking about the criticality of our ridership, and then in the rows, we're talking about our ridership uh, levels, uh, high and, and low. And so in the upper left-hand corner of this two by two is where we are, we are identifying this group of services as our uh, essential services that, uh, that really the goal of the framework is to preserve this level of service to the highest degree possible um, and be consistent with our um, target minimum acceptable level of service that, uh, that was defined in, in 2017. 
uh, this is this is where our greatest focus has been, and I think this is consistent with where we have seen uh, again high ridership and transit critical populations. This is really around the the the, the five factors that we just. Because the model has changed the MBTA goal. Low income locations, zero or low car households, communities of color, people with disabilities, and seniors. This is what we have categorized as our transit critical uh, population, and then our high ridership is is regions where we have seen a very durable ridership of our services. Pues dura más hasta en estos tiempos. Que nada tan tan horrible voy a traer y de ya no solo hay eso. That uh, that we've laid out for forging ahead. We are uh, we presented the the service changes at our FMCB meeting or, or board meeting on November the ninth. Uh, we are going through the public engagement process right now. We have 11 of these meetings, um, and then from the feedback we get from these public engagement meetings, the MBTA will be representing uh, to the board on no earlier than December 7th a a revision to our proposal uh, contingent on the acceptance of a Title VI uh, and a uh, environmental review for these service changes. And then, really, when we're talking about the implementation of some of these service changes. We have a timeline that uh, that really starts after the beginning of the year. Uh, very few, but there may be a couple of services on the commuter rail that may start as early as January, but the bulk of which would not go into effect until the May service change date. Along the ferry service lines, uh, we would not implement any of these service changes until March. Along the rapid transit lines, our red, blue, green, orange, we would not implement any changes until March. On the bus service, most of these changes would come into effect in late June, and then along the paratransit service or the ride, many of these services would go into effect uh, consistent with the service areas that that they uh, represent, but is is most closely tied to the timeline for changes to uh, to the bus service. Now, most of the uh, most of these services get reviewed at least semi annually. Uh, twice a year on the commuter rail, twice a year on the ferry, uh, but then four times or quarterly along rapid transit lines and the bus lines. And so we will have the opportunity as we go forward with the recovery from from the pandemic to evaluate our our ridership demands, our service levels, and adjust as the the revenue allows us to, and uh, and the ridership demands um, really inform our decision making. So at this point, I'd like to go through some of the proposed service changes that uh, that that affect this Mystic River Valley area and uh, and and then the, the larger service area that the MBTA serves. And we'll go through by uh, by mode uh, these these service changes. So before before we go through some of the service changes, I want to I want to redefine another term or, or define another term for you, which is base service. And so really what the new base service is that these service changes will reflect is the combination of that essential service. So essential service is that upper left of the two by two graphic that, uh, that I went through earlier. And so we will be, which represents about 82% of the ridership that we currently see today in uh, the fall of 2020. Uh, so that, the majority of that essential service plus reduced levels of non-essential services. So this, uh, the, these services are related to the, um, the, the consistent with the, the service policy uh, or better for the essential service and then some of the reduced service levels that we'll walk through. So the base service proposal will look very simple for where, where, where we operate in essential service uh, locations will look very similar to pre-COVID operations, very slight uh, revisions to some of, those, some of those services, which will be at or above the, uh, the, the service level policy for, for those services. It will vary regionally. For example, the, the 111 routes are, uh, is, is a very durable and, and very essential service, so it would be very, very little changes. However, the SL2, uh, which runs the Silver Line service to the seaport, which is still an essential service, will see 
less service um, than uh, and closer to the service level uh, policy published in 2017. Because of the, the lower ridership, some of the service reductions um, are not expected to significantly increase crowding because of the, the level of ridership that we have today. All essential services, I wanna just repeat, will be at or above the service delivery policy for frequency and span, which include the Fairmont corridor line, all rapid transit lines, including Mattapan, bus routes, many of the bus routes, approximately 80 of the bus routes, and the paratransit or ride service um, with some minor changes to the booking windows. Where we have reduced level of non-essential services based on demands, we'll see reduced peak service on all other commuter rail lines, no weekend service uh, or evening service reduced uh, midday service. So evening service is, is service after 9 p.m. And we'll see reduced frequency on some of the remaining bus routes, including smaller service areas and some consolidation of bus routes. This graphic here shows many of our service areas in, uh, in, in the region at the, uh, and the graphic to the right of the, of the slide. In blue, you'll see uh, services that are at or above the baseline frequency. In, in orange or the yellow color is below the baseline levels of service. And then in red, you'll see some of the proposed eliminations. Current weekday passenger trips, we will we expect to uh, really reflect 82% of weekday trips on essential services, 18% of weekday trips on non-essential services, 3% of current weekday trips will lack access or have to divert to propose changes as a result of some of these service changes. Base service represents our weekly service hours pre-COVID. We, we expect to be preside, pr providing 85% of our bus service that we provided pre-COVID, 70% of our rapid transit service that we provided pre-COVID, 65% of the service that we provided pre-COVID, and then we are eliminating the ferry service as part of this proposal, so 0% of our ferry service pre-COVID. And under this proposal, 78.5% of households in the MBTA service area have an MBTA service within one half mile compared to 82% of our ridership previously. Local to this, this is a blow up that's that's local to um, this region. That is that, that most of you uh, use the service for, and I'll go through some some specifics in the tables on the on the following slide. But in the graphic again, we're using the same color schema. Uh, blue line, sir, blue colored services uh, remain at or above baseline frequency standards. Yellow colored services are below baseline levels of service. And then red graphical uh, representations are, are proposed eliminated, eliminated or consolidated services that, that is part of this proposal. All of our essential bus routes are at or above baseline standards. Every bus route that is represented in, in the gray boxes and, and bold text represent our key bus routes as we have defined those, those bus routes, and, and they will have varying levels of, uh, of, of retention with, uh, with meeting that, that service standard. Uh, again, uh, highlighting the, the 111, which will look very similar to what the services that you see today versus the ESL2, which is running through the seaport, has very light ridership, will be much closer to the minimum service level standard that, uh, that, that the MBTA is committed to. So specifically in, in, in tabular format, uh, routes with routes that are local, working left to right here, proposed bus routes where we will be eliminating the routes, reflect the, the 131, the 136, the 325, the 326, the 434, and the 428. These routes have redundant service very nearby or, or other alternative services where riders who would normally ride these routes 
could, could very easily divert to a different mode of service for, for commute in and out of uh, the, the greater Metro Boston area. Commuter rail lines will be affected in this region uh, along the Haverhill and Newbury port lines where there would be no weekend service provided and that there would be no service after 9 p.m. Uh, and then we were proposing to uh, close the Cedar Park station as part of this proposal. Some of the bus routes with possible frequency below what we would call the baseline but still, um, but still serve, serve these, uh, these communities are the 101, the 112, the 132, the 137, the 426, the 430, 439, 441, 442, 450, 712, and 713. The specifics of the changes to these, to these routes on, on the commuter rail and on the bus routes uh, are still under development, and so specific timing of, of station stops and, and frequency are, are still under development as we go through this planning process. I'd like to walk through some of the regional changes uh, along the MBTA service by mode. And in this graphic, you'll see pre-COVID ridership along the commuter rail uh, in the dashed purple line and current or present day commuter rail ridership in the solid purple line. <clears throat> We're at approximately 13% of our normal ridership. We are uh, proposing uh, that we are uh, going to reduce some of the service here, and we will be, um, we, we are looking, we, sorry, we are seeing um, a, approximately 85% of the regular service that we ran before, with only about 8.5% uh, of our normal ridership along the commuter rail. So some changes at a glance that we are proposing for the commuter rail. We propose to continue to operate approximately 65% of pre-COVID service hours. We would be stopping all commuter rail service after 9 p.m., although the Fairmont line is likely to be closer to 10 p.m. as we finalize all the schedules with the uh, essential nature of that service. We will be stopping all weekend service, so we will not be running uh, service on, on uh, Saturdays and Sundays along the commuter rail. Um, and then we will be replacing the Fairmont service with a dedicated bus route. We'll be decreasing weekday peak service and some midday service, reducing from about 505 daily trains uh, to about 430 daily trains, or about an 85% delivery of, of service um, that we had pre-COVID. Closing about six of 141 stations uh, based on their ridership numbers, and operational impacts, and then the availability of alternative service at nearby stations. The specific service levels by line are still in the development, and they will take into account the ridership patterns uh, from the adjusted fall 2020 schedules, and we'll have a much more balanced uh, service day throughout, uh, throughout the, 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 the changes that we will be presenting uh, when we finalize these plans. Bus ridership. You'll see that uh, we are about 41% of pre-COVID ridership. That's reflected in this graphic to the right-hand side where we have the pre-COVID 2019 bus ridership in the dashed yellow line, and we have the solid yellow line representing present day ridership. And there's significant variation in the level of durability of the ridership along these routes. I've used the same example several times with the Route 111, which is greater than 60% ridership today from pre-COVID uh, ridership numbers, and the SL2, which is significantly lower at 20% of ridership. So great variation between the various bus routes that, uh, that we see um, pre and uh, post-COVID. 21 routes have more significantly more service than pre-COVID to help prevent crowding. And these are interim measures that we put into place as we were managing through the COVID pandemic. And these are being considered as part of our uh, network design as we are building out the schedules for the al alternative service that we are proposing in this, uh, in this proposal. <clears throat> so at a glance, we are, we are proposing to continue to operate approximately 85% of our pre-COVID 
service hours on, on our bus service. Regardless of whether it's essential service, all bus service will stop after midnight. That is, that is a universal change to both the bus service and the rapid transit service, is that rather than the 1 a.m. approximate end time for service, we will be stopping service at midnight. We'd be reducing frequency on essential and non-essential routes, uh, ranging from uh, a, approximately a low of 5%, uh, or reducing that average by about 5%, Significantly less on very high ridership routes like the 111, the 116, the 109, and much greater for others, potentially as much as 20 to 30 percent based on ridership levels that we're seeing today. We would also reduce frequency of non essential routes by approximately 25, 20 percent on average system wide. The reduction will vary from route to route, similar to on our essential service based on the ridership numbers that we have. Out of 169 MBTA routes, we're proposing to consolidate 14 of those routes, shorten five, and eliminate 25. Of the eliminated routes, seven are within a quarter mile of alternative bus or rapid transit service, which we've not strand ride, uh, riders. 12 of those routes serve non-transit critical and low ridership trips. Those are our bottom right-hand box on that two by two graphic. Six of the routes serve high transit critical riders but have very low ridership and have significant but not fully alternative options. Likely these are, these are areas where we, we see that the ridership has an alternative for providing the, the trips that they took pre-COVID to the trips that they're taking now. We would be eliminating suburban subsidy program, which partially funds five additional services, the Bedford, Beverly, Burlington, Lexington, and Mission Hill but fewer than 200 average weekday riders. About 1.1% of pre-COVID ride trips would be shifted from ADA to premium as it relates to their paratransit service. No changes to the overall geographic coverage area are proposed, but there would be some hours of operations that may change to the uh, schedule, to the, to, to the modes, and we would be lengthening scheduling windows for uh, paratransit ride um, uh, scheduling windows from 30 minutes to 40 minutes. And then, as I mentioned several times, all operating routes will continue to be reviewed and we will be adjusting those, the, the, the service that we're providing on a quarterly or semi-annually basis uh, as we start to see ridership return post-COVID. The rapid transit ridership, our subway system, is uh, it represented by our, our heavy rail and light rail, the blue line, green line, orange, and red. You see the graphics here of the ridership that, uh, that we've seen on those lines. And as I've mentioned before in the presentation and you've, you've heard uh, in, in other conversations, the, the level of ridership has, has come back and has been affected in, in different ways on the different service lines. Uh, ranging from, from a high on the blue line where we're at approximately 37%, uh, ridership from pre-COVID numbers to 20% to on, on the green line ridership. Um, these, are, uh, th these are all uh, levels of ridership based on uh, us returning to a 100% of pre-COVID service levels. So we, we are running just as many trains today as we were one year ago with this level of ridership. Again, changes at a glance to the rapid transit system. We are proposing to uh, run 70% of pre-COVID service hours. Again, as I mentioned with bus, we'd be stopping all service after midnight, uh, but there would be no, no change to the start of service time. We'd be reducing the frequency or the, the time between trains by about 20% across all lines. Although that may vary line by line and at the time by time of day of, uh, of service. Similarly to bus, we'll be reviewing and adjusting those as part of our quarterly service planning process. And the implementation timeline may be adjusted based on state and federal guidelines for social distancing. One other uh, more, more significant change to the rapid transit uh, service that we provide is we will be stopping the E-Line service at Brigham Circle, and we'll be diverting the Huntington Ave running E-Line service with a stop, five stops along that approximate one mile 
to the Route 39. And we'd be increasing service on the Route 39 to help control crowding as, and also be reviewing this, this service modification as part of our quarterly service planning process. So giving a, giving a glance of our base service across all of our operating modes, uh, you will see here a breakdown of what our FY21 budgeted service is uh, in, the, in the second column and what our proposal FY22 base service is, where we have a re revision to our hours of operation. We have a frequency change or the, the number of number of minutes between trains or the, the, the other impacts to, uh, to some of those rapid transit service. And then you see our service delivery policy in the far right hand column of our, uh, that, that reflects our 2017 service policy and, uh, and how our service compares to the service policy, which is still uh, at or, or, or greater level of service than our service policy. And then service on, on the ferry uh, is proposed to be suspended uh, for all of our services. Um, the Charlestown to Boston service, the, the F4, uh, is, is flagged as a potentially essential service early on, but due to very low COVID ridership and, and high redundant service along the bus, uh, the 93 route, uh, which is an essential bus route, uh, we, are, we are moving forward with a proposal to stop the ferry service from Charlestown to, to Boston. Um, the 93 bus has been evaluated and, and found to have minimal crowding and can support the, uh, the ridership that will be diverted from, from the ferry service. Now, as I mentioned, and uh, we've mentioned in other presentations, this is, this is a process that we're hoping is, is temporary and we're able to build back. And so in the next few slides, I wanna go through how we plan to utilize some of the work we had been doing pre-COVID, planning for enhancing our service as we think about bringing back service when ridership demands and revenue can support bringing back service. We hope to bring back service packages uh, through thematic groupings um, with uh, building off of our base service um, and meant to enable policy level decision on returning service. We're looking for this public process to help inform MBTA staff and the board on how to prioritize bringing back service and based on some of the uh, impacts to the community and, and how we can best prioritize uh, bringing back service as more funding becomes available, if more funding becomes available, and how the trade-offs between some of the uh, some of the, the the levers that we're that we're utilizing from a operating budget and a capital budget and the service reductions can allow us to do so, and then understanding the preferences uh, of bringing back uh, services that uh, the board and the public can can ass can assist us with making those those informed decisions, um, and it, so that in the springtime we can make those decisions faster. We look to build off of um, these, these different options, so across rapid transit, uh, our options are to re restore frequency or, re or restore evening service. Along the commuter rail, possibly restore weekend service or restore uh, evening service. In the dash box, I'm gonna come back to. Along bus service, restore frequency along the essential routes, restore frequency on non-essential routes or restore evening service on the bus. Along the ferry, possibly restore partial ferry service to Charles, from Charlestown to Boston, or restore partial ferry service from Hingham to Hull. The other, the, the, the information in the, in the dash boxes are to invest in some of the new connections and services that we would have uh, developed as part of our rail vision work that, that we were undertaking pre-COVID uh, where we were looking at some of the some of the different uh, commuter rail services to provide inner city rail or or uh, or, or more uh, more changes to our rail network with different service modifications, and then along the bus to invest in some of our uh, better bus and bus network redesign changes 
as we were looking at some of the uh, service modifications that we thought would be beneficial to the community in our operation. So the public engagement, this is, this is extremely important to us to hear from you tonight and over the, uh, over the next uh, coming weeks uh, on how this framework of essential services makes sense to all of you, uh, to the rest of the, the service, uh, to, to the rest of the community that we provide service to, and how we can uh, think about the prioritization of returning uh, service. Which of the proposed changes will have the most impact? And are there adjustments? Is there something that we missed? Are there, are there, are there areas of, of reconsideration that, that we should be making? And then how should we prioritize uh, adding service back uh, through some of the options that I laid out earlier or other options uh, as we see ridership return and revenue start to climb? I think at this point, I'm, I will conclude my presentation and uh, ask Angel Donahue Rodriguez to, uh, to moderate the clarifying questions and testimony. Thank you, Eric, for that presentation. <clears throat> As a reminder, we will first answer clarifying questions and then open the floor for comments and testimonials. If you have a clarifying question on the presentation, please type it into the chat pod now. Other questions and comments are welcome in the chat pod but we will only be answering clarifying questions aloud. All comments are part of the meeting record and will be shared with MBTA leadership. If you're an elected official who would like to make a public comment or staffer, kindly rename yourself with your affiliation so I know to call on you. You can rename yourself by clicking on the three ellipses next to your name and clicking rename. We ask that all members of the public be respectful of a two minute time so that we can ensure that everyone who would like to be heard can be heard. We also have other members of our staff here today, including Director of, of, of Service Planning, Mr. Rob Guptill, Executive Director of the Community Rail, Mr. Rob Diadamo, and Deputy Director of Paratransit Technology, Mr. Michael Schneider. Next slide, please. To make a comment, you must virtually raise your hand. To do this on the computer, please click Alt-Y or click on the raise hand button under the participants tab at the bottom center of your screen. On a mobile device, tap the raise hand button in the bottom center of your screen. On the phone, dial star nine. Once you raise your hand, you'll be added to a queue with others who have raised their hands. I will call on folks on a first come first serve basis. When it is your turn to speak, I will say your last name or the last four digits of your phone number and let you know that I am unmuting you. If, you or, or if you're on a computer or a mobile device, a box will pop up at the center of your screen. You will need to confirm that you would like to be unmuted before you begin speaking. If you're on the phone, an automated recording will let you know that you are unmuted. You may speak as soon as the recording finishes. Once you are unmuted, Everyone in the meeting can hear you. Before making your comment, please slowly state your name and any organizational affiliation. And please remember to speak slowly as we have interpreters working with us this evening. Please limit all comments to no more than two minutes. We ask that you only, take, that you only make one comment at a time so that we ensure everyone gets an opportunity to speak. If you have an additional comments, please raise your hand again. And as soon as you're finished, we will, we will, you will be muted again. You may also uh, post more comments in the chat and we will document them as part of the meeting record. Now, I, there is one clarifying question that I see uh, and that is uh, currently many bus routes will uh, routes wait until last heavy rail, light rail train stops at a, at a station before departing on the bus's last trip of the evening. Will this practice continue once all service ends at midnight? Thank you. Uh, so I, I think I'd like to call on uh, Rob Gupta to help us with that, but I don't believe we would be, um, uh, let me let Rob answer that, but I can't imagine we would be stranding passengers riding the rapid transit service to a bus connection. Yes, Eric, I can handle that question. 
Um, I'm Robert Guptel, I'm the Director of Service Planning. And just as today, um, as the clarifying question asks, uh, we will continue to operate bus trips that wait until those subway trips arrive at the station and then depart uh, to serve those last subway trips of the night. That is a practice that we will continue to, um, to do as we bring the span of service back to midnight. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Um, I'd also like to ask if the interpreters have any clarifying questions that have been that have been asked of them at this moment. Not seeing any. And I'm not seeing any more clarifying questions. Um, so I would like to move on uh, to the next piece. Uh, which is the testimonials and comments. Um, <clears throat> ask for elected, I'm gonna ask elected officials to say a few brief remarks um, and, then, uh, and then we will go over to the rest of the public to make comments uh, and testimonials. Uh, I am now going to uh, unmute our, uh, State Representative Kate Lipper Garabedian. Uh, Representative, you uh, just requested for you to be unmuted. Excellent, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. I hope everyone is well. I want to thank the secretary and her leadership team for putting together a robust public um, outreach effort with all of these different uh, virtual meetings, as well as the online form that you've provided uh, to receive additional feedback. And certainly uh, we and the legislature, and I know among elected officials in the cities and towns, will try to help put out information and broadcast um, you know, these proposals so that you get as much possible feedback as you can. Um, I also really commend you on thinking critically about making these uh, meetings accessible to folks who uh, speak languages other than English, um, the hearing impaired. Um, and so, you know, if there are other ways in which we can be partners in sharing information, please feel free to lean on us to do that. Um, you, I think, are in receipt of a letter that I uh, assisted in drafting with the delegation that represents the city of Malden. Uh, that includes Senator Jason Lewis, uh, Leader Paul Donato, Representative Steve Altrino. I believe at least uh, Leader Donato is also on the phone uh, with us tonight. Uh, the other two gentlemen may have uh, conflicts, including a budget um, deliberation that's happening right now in the Senate. So I won't uh, repeat everything that's in that letter, but just given the opportunity, I, I thought I would um, provide a sense of the highlights of it, which are essentially that as the Malden delegation, we are concerned, uh, significantly concerned with the proposed reductions in service to the residents of Malden and the degree to which it's happening at this time. While we are in fact in the midst of a fiscal year 21 budget deliberation, I think the Senate is thinking about some language even tonight on transportation. And then we're going to turn in the very near, um, you know, coming months to the fiscal 22 budget, um, at which point there will be another opportunity uh, for legislators to think about ways in which we can support and invest in public transportation. And finally, uh, as noted in the letter, we are in a post-election world. Uh, we have a new federal administration that's going to take office soon. Uh, and I have hope that perhaps there can be some real attention uh, and progress on stimulus that would support our public transportation system here in the greater Boston area. Uh, I don't have to tell you how important public transportation is to Boston. And while it is true that ridership is down across the system, there are absolutely people who depend on it each day uh, to navigate to, to accomplish tasks that are necessary to keep their families afloat. And that particularly falls on people who are essential workers and are lower income residents and perhaps also people with disabilities. I have certainly as the representative heard from multiple constituents who have disabilities who are incredibly fearful of the ways in which reductions or potential eliminations are going to make their lives so much more difficult. Uh, in Malden, specifically, you probably know, um, is a poster child for housing development at a time when our 
uh, region is really suffering a crisis in terms of housing supply and affordability. In the last five years alone, Malden has built more than 1,500 housing units in the downtown corridor alone. Uh, and certainly we're seeing housing growth throughout the city. And people are making decisions about where to live and where to invest based on proximity to bus routes uh, and to, in this case for Malden, um, the T-stops. Um, so, you know, this will have real impacts for folks uh, to the degree that their services are less available to them moving forward. Uh, finally, I would point out that as we reduce service, we are going to force people to make less uh, beneficial decisions for our environment at a time when the state has committed to meeting aggressive climate change um, goals. And, and so some of these cuts are going to be coming online in the spring, uh, just as perhaps we're living in an environment in which the vaccine is becoming more available and people are hopefully going to be looking for opportunities to get back to work and back to their normal uh, way of life. And, and so they're going to be forced into additional, you know, private vehicles that were going to enhance and exacerbate the gridlock that we experienced pre-COVID, some of the worst, if not the worst, in the country. My final point is something that I didn't, um, we didn't raise in the letter, but I just would put um, to your consideration, which is, it's certainly reassuring to hear that these cuts are not intended to be permanent, uh, but it's not necessarily, there's no guarantee of that. Um, and one thing I don't see is while there is, um, you know, a general sense of timeline for how things would be reassessed, we don't see objective criteria or measures or metrics that you might use to confirm when in fact it's time to bring something back online or back to full strength. Um, and I would love to see that more explicit, including a recognition built into any models that you're using that a, a less supply is going to um, unnaturally depress the demand. So you're, you're, there's definitely going to be greater demand than you're necessarily going to be seeing if you start to reduce service. Um, and the final thing I would note is there's no mention in your slide related to of options of what to add back in, of adding back bus routes or adding back online closures of stations. Um, that's something we can talk more about when we get to a different region of the MBTA because I don't believe in Malden there's anything that is proposed to be completely eliminated. Um, but certainly that's of concern to me. There are actually a couple bus routes that come through Malden originating elsewhere that are proposed to be eliminated, at least in the short term. I don't see them, the, the, the idea of bringing back a bus line as being one of those options in the slide uh, toward the end of your deck. So thank you for your time. I look forward to being in touch with you. Again, I would suggest that maybe we can take this slow and consider some of the ongoing budget discussions happening both at the state and federal level um, and continue to prioritize public transportation as a public good. Thank you, Representative. Again, uh, I'd ask folks if you would like to make a comment to please rate, use the raise hand feature that is available. Uh, and we will take your comments and testimony. Uh, next, I'm going to unmute um, Councillor Winslow uh, from Malden. Councillor, you've just been asked to uh, unmute. All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, representative, uh, uh, yeah uh, the representative spoke very well for Malden and, and the whole uh, sense of delegation. I, I do think, I mean, Malden, 40% um, of our residents rely on the train and buses to um, you know, to get around um, and commute to work, so it's a very essential service here. Um, you know, very concerned, especially about people who are essential workers um, who are still going into Boston to work in hospitals and and other places and cleaning services and that type of thing. And um, you know, they often work uh, evening shifts, um, the midnight service. Uh, hopefully, they'll be make a, able to make arrangements to meet meet that midnight bus, but um, you know, that would be a key thing in the future. I do appreciate all the hard work and thought that's gone in here. I mean, I've, I've looked at, um, you know, the core of things that are happening in Malden and, um, you know, there's, there's no major bus route that's, that's impacted. I, I mean, I, I know there's some in Melrose that are being adjusted or eliminated, but there are parallel services. But, um, uh, you know, I just think, you know, one of the concerns is, um, you know, the permanence thing, uh, you know, 
people can easily stop buying a T pass every month, but once you've sunk and invested in buying a card or getting around a different way, um, that can, you know, people are going to be, you know, car payments are six or eight years now. So, um, so that's one of the concerns you get people out of that habit or into the habit of driving. Um, that's going to have, have an impact. And um, for the people who can afford that many people in Malden can't even make that choice. Um, so, uh, we appreciate that you recognize this essential services. Those things um, really need to, to rebound. Um, you know, one of the things in just looking at the data you have in terms of what's happening pre-COVID, post-COVID, um, I mean, I think you also have to think that the, the big drop in peak, peak is, you know, we, is, is a, you know, really a reaction um, in terms of people's fear of being in crowded spaces. Um, once a you know virus gets uh, the the vaccine is out there and people feel a little more confident, the peak may snap back more quickly than you might think. Um, so that's just something to um, be aware of that um, you know that may be you know start happening more soon. I I'd actually like to have see things considered to snap back by September um, rather than December um, to to start looking at things there. Um, and uh, you know one of the other things you know just for Malden. Uh, we just did a, a traffic survey this past week on uh, Route 99 Broadway, which is a major um, street that you know leads through Everton into downtown Boston. And um, the traffic in Malden has already recovered to um, pre-COVID levels on that street. So the concern is is that if there's not some recovery in commuter rail or other more outerlying services, that traffic is all going to end up funneling into Malden eventually. I mean, we know that. Yes, of course, the Orange Line service and, and the parking lots at Oak Grove and uh, Wellington are, 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 have a lot of spaces right now. But when the services recover, um, if the commuter rail isn't there, uh, you know, people are, you know, the, the option for people, um, you know, if they can't get into Boston, you know, are, are going to be coming into Malden. That's going to really adversely impact us. And like I say, we're seeing traffic recovering already. So that's one of the concerns we have um, as well. So, but, um, you know, the real concern is that um, making sure that, uh, you know, if this is a dimming down, that we're quick to, to get it get going back up. I, I'm concerned of the thought of, you know, thinking this is an 18 month, uh, you know, sh sh slow down when in fact things may start recovering within six to nine months. So that's, that's a concern, but, you know, fundamentally, we have a lot of people in Malden who rely on tra transportation. Uh, we need that to be robust and we will be impacted um, from the people outside of our region um, who lose service because they'll have to come through Malden to, to get access to the service that does remain. So thank you very much and uh, have a good evening. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next, I am going to call on Ms. Uh, Juliana uh, Morse. Uh, I'm going to ask to unmute you. Should be unmuted. Hi there. Um, all right. Thank you. My name is Juliana Morris. I'm a physician at the Chelsea Health Center and I live in East Boston. I use the blue line and silver line to commute to work and I'm very concerned about these proposed cuts. There's already too much crowding on the central lines. I've been on the blue line in the weekends with 50 people that I counted in one car. And during my commuting hours, it's often impossible to maintain the six feet of physical distancing from other riders. So we have to remember that the ridership baseline pre-COVID often involved us being packed into these cars and the trains like sardines. Uh, so from a public health standpoint, thank goodness that there are fewer riders and I would argue that for at certain times of day There needs to be even more lines running to fully allow for physical distancing Even a 3% cut 5% cut will have drastic consequences and In all places, you know Chelsea Revere Malden Everett where we've seen terrible disparities, our black and brown communities being hit terribly by COVID. These need to be communities where the maintenance of the public transportation is maintained. Um, 
I, I'm aware of the community organizations that are working really hard on coming up with alternative proposals and uh, tax measures that may be able to offset the costs so that we can make sure that we are able to maintain the physical distancing, not to mention all of the terrible health impacts that will come from people's employment and other things that they need to travel for being affected. Thank you very much. Next, I'm going to call on uh, Mr. Peter Christopher from Winthrop. I'm going to ask you to I'm going to ask you to unmute now. You should be unmuted. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you. I just um, wanted to give a few comments about the impact that this is going to have on my community in Winthrop, where I'm a town councilor. Um, Essentially, I wanted to just state from the bat get go that the 712 and the 713 buses that uh, operate in Winthrop are operated by a private contractor and that the T gets a bang for its buck in Winthrop that it really doesn't get most places elsewhere in the system. Uh, but the trade off with that is, is that the frequency of trips in, within Winthrop right now are just things that wouldn't be acceptable in other parts of the metro Boston area. Um, if you were to arrive at Orion Heights on a Sunday, uh, where, which is the train station where people uh, exit and go into Winter or get on the bus, um, there is one that comes once every 40 minutes. Uh, I'm, 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 you know, that, that's concerning because I think that that probably only means that there's one bus at any given time on a Sunday um, servicing our community and a reduction from one uh, is is zero. Um, and I also would like to note that we have a high ridership um, in our community that yearns for more reliable transit options. I hear this frequently from constituents of mine. Um, and over the years, our town, uh, you know, years ago recognized the need to supplement the service that we had even in good times. Um, and we did that by creating a, a completely town run ferry that we um, that runs back and forth into, uh, into Boston every day during the fall, spring, and summer months. Um, so the service is popular and we're, we're really happy to provide that, but it underscores the fact that we have uh, scores of people who are searching for more reliable transit options in our community. Um, and I worry that a reduction in service uh, in our community would further emphasize a trend that we've been trying to break for years that you don't need to have a car to live in Winthrop. Um, and we can, only, we can only break this trend by providing reliable transportation options to people uh, in our community here. Um, I'd also like to see echo some of the sentiments from the state representative who spoke earlier about objective measures so that we, we could look, that we could look to, to restore service as we restore service so that these these um, reduction these service reductions don't become permanent. I'd also like to ask that we appreciate the fact that the less frequent split times are going to restrict people's ability to practice social distancing uh, on uh, public transit vehicles. So I, I recognize that it's difficult to maintain service in such uncertain times. However, I believe that the damage that could be done in the interim in the time between when these cuts get made and when we're awaiting stronger ridership to resume could be uh, potentially devastating and that it could force people back into their cars and make habits that would be difficult to break. Um, so I urge you to make these restrictions as limited as possible, especially in Winthrop where um, the reliability of transit options is already an issue prior to this. Um, so I thank you for the opportunity, um, and I really appreciate the outreach that you've done uh, through these meetings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to remind folks um, that you can raise your hand uh, by phone by uh, dialing star nine, uh, and to please raise your hands uh, if you would like to make a comment or testimony. We are here to listen to you uh, and to get your feedback. Uh, next, I'm going to call on uh, Mr. Johnny uh, Pereira, uh, who has raised his hand. I'm, ask, I'm gonna ask to unmute you now. Hello, thank you. Yeah, my name is Johnny Gomez Pereira. I'm a Chelsea resident. I just wanted to sort of raise some of my concerns with like these um, cuts. I know 
you've, um, in your presentation, you mentioned that 116, 117 um, are, have actually seen those increases, but I would argue that I, I think that's not enough. Um, as a resident who sort of commutes between my home city, which is Chelsea, to um, Boston, just for literal everyday life, I think it's kind of concerning that we're not able to socially distance in um, these buses. Although there have been increases, like I don't remember her name, but she mentioned that there really isn't the ability to, social, to socially distance. Um, and if you sort of look at COVID data, you will see that communities of color like Chelsea um, have bared the burden of this pandemic. Basicamente que han sufrido más. Uh, working, um, working folk in Chelsea are considered essential workers. And many of them rely on, the, on public transportation that involves the 116, 117, 111, Blue Line, all of these things. And it's, it's incredibly frustrating as a resident um, and to, to see that we're not really being taken into consideration or the health of the folk who take these um, public transport routes are not really thought of. Um, yeah, it just sort of compounds the issue that is uh, class, um, race disparities within um, Massachusetts. It, I'm really, I'm hoping that you guys will sort of change course. I don't know how likely that is, but I would urge you guys to sort of wait until um, new administration pops in and hopefully we will see some sort of aid coming in um, from the federal level. Yeah, I, I, I would sort of ask y'all to reflect on how you get to work. And if you don't have to commute, um, I would urge you to think of, about those of us who do. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, it is my understanding that Representative Joseph McGonagall wanted to say a few words. Representative, I'm gonna uh, ask to unmute you. Should be unmuted. Thank, thank you. I'm the old buck in this group that doesn't really know how to use all this technology, but I'm learning. And uh, thank you, Eric, for your presentation. It's always great to see you, Secretary Pollock. Um, you know, ever, what we're trying to do with rapid bus transit, um, everything that the mayor's on board with, and, and we're excited to do it. We're hoping other cities and towns join us in that effort. Um, with that said, Secretary, I'm nervous. Um, with this pandemic that uh, any ridership cuts puts another unfair burden on, on our essential workers. Um, where we're gonna be overloading buses. I'm nervous about that. Um, that's a great concern, especially in all the gateway cities. Um, you know, I'm a big supporter of, uh, of our gateway cities. Um, and, and the other thing that concerns me too, um, to everyone is the ride. I don't want you to forget how important the ride is, especially um, to our seniors and our communities. Um, extremely important because I get it. You know, I get the calls from them worried about that those services will be cut uh, also. So um, I'm please, I'm begging you to take that into consideration. And uh, Secretary, I'm praying, I'm praying that, uh, you know, this transportation bond bill would get passed in this session. And I think um, that could be a help uh, to all of us too. So um, I urge anybody out there, you know what I mean, to uh, reach out to your legislature, your senators, your representatives to push the, uh, the uh, transportation bond bill through. Um, those are just some of my comments, but, uh, but th thank you. And thank you, Representative. I, I did talk to both of the chairs today, and, and I think after the budget, the, the bond bill will start moving. Thank you, Representative. Uh, it is my understanding that last digits 1673 is Representative Paul Donato, who would like to make some comments. I'm going to ask to unmute you, uh, uh, and then just please state your name. Hi, good evening. This is uh, State Representative Paul Donato. So, uh, Madam Secretary and, and to the T, thank you for the opportunity to uh, have this uh, 
uh, opportunity to express uh, our concerns. And I'm sure they're concerned as well, uh, Madam Secretary, to you and, and to your staff. But I do have some, uh, and by the way, uh, Representative Gavin Vivian did a great job in <clears throat> outlining exactly what the Malden delegation's uh, position is with regard to what's happening in Malden. And, and Councilor Winslow uh, just mentioned that 40% uh, of the of the residents of the city of Malden uh, need public transportation. My concern uh, uh, is twofold. The, the first fold is, is that uh, we're talking about uh, the curtailing of the bus routes and, and uh, pulling back some of the uh, bus routes uh, that uh, are, are in Malden and the, the timeline that's going to be affected with that. Um, I'm hoping that uh, the T, Madam Secretary, would uh, take a second look at this and see whether or not if the bond bill is going to pass and we're, you know, we pass it in the House and we're concerned, concerned that it gets through the Senate. And if it does, perhaps some of the monies that have been allocated for capital improvements can be reallocated at a time when, with this pandemic, at a time when we need to provide service to the, to the, to the ridership and uh, the expansion of uh, the T at this particular time may have to be put on hold. So that's one of the thoughts that uh, that uh, I ha I have, and my concern uh, with the the uh, residents of Malden who who uh, rely heavily on uh, public transportation. And as uh, Representative Gabidian pointed out, in five years, 1,500 new uh, buildings have been uh, uh, established right in the downtown Malden area. Access to the T is uh, essential. And uh, so that uh, it, this is something that we were very concerned about. Um, in my other hat, as the uh, representative from Malden, I am extremely disappointed in the 325 and the 326 because it does put the North Medford residents in a very difficult position because there is no other service in, in uh, the upper North Medford area to accommodate uh, those, particularly the elderly and the disabled. So, I'd, uh, you know, I know that we talked about that once before. We were able to restore it. I would hope that uh, the, the T takes a second look at it and maybe uh, has an opportunity to restore partially some of the, the uh, route of uh, 325 and 326. As far as Malden is concerned, please keep in, in, in mind that the, that the minority population there relies heavily on, on uh, bu uh, public transportation and it's something that uh, in the future that uh, we don't want to make it so that uh, these people either A, lose jobs or find alternative transportation and only exacerbate the, the problems we have with climate control. So I thank you for the opportunity to at least uh, express my views. Thank you, Representative. Um, again, I'd like to remind folks if you're on the phone, you can raise your hand by uh, pressing star nine. Uh, and you can use, you can send us a chat uh, and it'll be part of the record. Uh, and then if you'd like to speak, again, I remind folks to raise your hands. Uh, we are here to listen to uh, your comments and your suggestions uh, on forging ahead. Next, I'm going to unmute Ms. Olivia Nichols. Ms. Nichols, uh, you've just been asked to unmute. Hi, good evening. My name is Olivia Nichols and I'm an organizer with Green Roots in Chelsea and East Boston and a rider of the T myself. And I first wanted to raise up the 112 bus, which is a route in Chelsea and how uh, I'm part of a group called the Chelsea Public Transportation Task Force that's been doing work to improve uh, bus service for years. And just recently at the beginning of the fall, we finally were able to achieve uh, the victory of getting an added bus on the route. And so much work from community members went into that. And I'm seeing that the 112 is not labeled as a non, is labeled as a non-essential route. So it may be facing a 20% service reduction. And so uh, that is just another example, I think, of the MBTA going back on a promise made that came out of community work and is just kind of leaving the community out to dry. And just to speak a bit more broadly to everything that's going around right now, going on right now, I, I believe that with these budget cuts, what we're seeing basically is that the public is being punished by 
taking away our access to public transit due to low ridership when I believe that transportation is a communal necessity and so that service should exist regardless of where ridership is looking at level wise. And I just also like to raise that uh, billionaires in Massachusetts, um, over the first three months of the pandemic, 18 Massachusetts billionaires saw their wealth increase by almost $17 billion during the pandemic. And so I'm using this point to say that the T needs to find more progressive revenue, like raising taxing on unearned and corporate income, because the rich are continuing to profit this year instead of paying their fair share into the system of public transit that benefits everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, again, just to remind folks, and we have it in the chat, you can make comments. Uh, testimony uh, here on the uh, Zoom group chat. Uh, and again, if you're on the phone, I'd like to remind folks that you can, uh, that you can uh, ask to be, uh, you can raise your hands using uh, star nine. Uh, and we, again, we encourage you to raise your hands. Uh, next, uh, I am going to ask Ms. Susan Backstrom uh, to, uh, to speak. Um, I'm gonna ask to unmute you now. Should be unmuted. All right. Um, my name is Susan Backstrom. I'm uh, part of the Chelsea Disability Commission. And uh, I'd like to say here, here to what Olivia had brought uh, about promises made. Um, part of the promise of the ADA is the, is the ubiquity of transportation for people with disabilities. And I was just trying to you know, uh, figure out how people uh, whose who's, uh, ride, uh, ride possibilities are for the ride, um, how their, po if, you know, how their possibilities, if they shrink the possibilities, where they are going to uh, be able to access what they need to do without this. Um, I use the ride, um, and it, it it is a really important part of how I get to doctor's appointments, and I get to um, and I get to civic duties, um, of which there are lots, and I uh, I get to part participate in social things like the Abilities Expo at the BCEC, and uh, and also the um, well Boston Comic Con, but the the these uh, the things that are essential for someone with a differing ability uh, it, it it is about getting around the city, and the city isn't isn't easily accessible on on a wheelchair anyway. The wear and tear on my fiance's motorized chair is uh, is noticeable. We live in Chelsea. It's a, the, the sidewalks and things are the, the kind of old school uh, sidewalks from the 1800s and, and it, it's, it's a bit rough on the, on the equipment. So the ride is necessary in order to uh, save the equipment and, uh, and also the to just to echo with what uh, Joseph McGonigal was saying, there is a there is a, a necessity to keep that going and um, and to keep that accessibility for for our disabled communities and uh, and I look forward to speaking more about these things with uh, with the the members of the FCM, FMCB and the members of the MassDOT who, who attend these, these meetings. Um, I, I'm, I'm really grateful for the, for the interaction with, with the people who, who run the, these, um, these essential needs for our community. And, uh, Thank you for letting me speak tonight and uh, 
please don't please please go so careful with the, the cuts on the ride thank you thank you very much uh ms backstrom um uh, right now, I do not see anyone uh, that has raised their hand. Again, if you would like to raise your hands, um, we are here. Uh, uh, if you're on the phone, star nine. Uh, and if you'd like to participate, either uh, make your comments on the chat or you can raise your use the use your uh, hand feature. Um, uh, so uh, we are here uh, until eight. That is our commitment, and we intend to we intend to keep to that. So if you would like to say something, again, we encourage you, folks, um, to uh, to to raise your hands. Hey, Angel, I, I do want to uh, address um, what Ms. Backstrom just mentioned about uh, being careful with uh, cuts to the ride service. Um, the, <clears throat> the, there, there are a few areas um, within the ride network uh, at, at the extremities of the, of the ride network where the, the fare may, uh, may, may change from uh, from, from a normal fare to a premium fare. I don't believe there's any in the service area that, that we're looking at right now, but the, the finer details will, um, will be reflected in, in the final proposal. And, uh, and then the, really the only other changes that are part of this proposal uh, reflect the, the same service hour changes or similar service hour changes um, uh, with, the, uh, with, with the, 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 the commuter rail um, service after 9 p.m. and the uh, it being eliminated and the service hours for rapid transit and bus um, ceasing at, at midnight or thereabouts. Uh, so those are the, the most, I think that's the majority of changes that would affect the ride as well. Thank you, Eric. Um, again, I'd uh, just like to remind folks to please raise your hands if you have any other comments. Um, we are here till eight o'clock. So I'm going to give everyone a few minutes if they would like to say a few words. Um, and then if, if I hear none, um, we will go to closing remarks, but we will stay on uh, online until eight o'clock uh, as is our commitment. Thank you. We'll give it a few minutes. See some folks had raised their hands. Um, I am going to call on Miss Juliana Morris. Oh no! Uh, looks like that changed, uh, Mr. Pereira. It looks like you were were asking to speak again. I'm going to unmute you now. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if any of you on the planning board um, would be able to sort of elaborate on how you are reaching out to the folks who will be most affected by these um, reductions in the upcoming year, right? Because I'm seeing, I know, I understand that this is regional, right? This is the like Northern Mystic River group, but plenty of folks who are riding the bus and train and, you know, use these uh, public transit options are not really included in this conversation, which I find to be extremely troubling. Um, I'm hoping that y'all would be able to sort of either postpone <laughs> these actual reductions or, um, you know, actually like come up with innovative ways really to sort of engage the public because not everyone has access to um, the internet or knows how, that don't have the digital literacy to figure out how to use zoom and um that really just excludes them from this whole process right I, this whole meeting is meant to solicit public feedback and that's really not possible for everyone um so yeah i was just wondering if you guys could sort of elaborate on how you're reaching out to those folks essential workers who rely on the uh mbta to sort of provide feedback testimonies 
or anything that might alter that that could help alter the current course of the MBTA with um, reductions in service. Thank you, Mr. Perra. I, I I will take that uh, question. Uh, we have a team of community liaisons that is currently actively engaging the community. We have reached out to approximately 700, 177 different community organizations within, within the entire network. Um, and we continue to, we received over a thousand comments at this point uh, with our folks. Um, and uh, we have our mbta.com uh, slash forging ahead website where people can solicit, we can solicit uh, uh, comments and feedback from folks, as well as uh, get in answers from the community liaisons. And uh, I am happy to uh, to provide you with my contact information if you would like to uh, to, to solicit other feedback or comments uh, aside from today. Um, we we've been we've been working with community organizations for about a month and a half, um, and we will continue to do so uh, uh, after uh, forging ahead. Yeah, and I just want to re-emphasize what Angel said. The MBTA is very committed to doing um, as much public engagement as possible. And um, the community liaison is a new idea to directly solicit information from riders. You can email public engagement at mbta.com if you represent a neighborhood group or a group that would want to hear from the community liaisons. Um, we've also, I, you, uh, I appreciate the comment about computer literacy, but um, we do see more and more people who can do it. And in addition to this Zoom format, um, please encourage folks, especially folks who use specific services, to, to go on to the um, Forging Ahead website. There is an online comment tool that allows people to talk about their specific service. Um, so we, we want people to, um, tell us, you know, like we've heard this evening, I use this particular bus, I'm an, I'm an essential worker, you may be underestimating how many people are using such and such a service. So um, I, I do want people to know that in addition to these kinds of meetings that we're having this evening, there is the ability to send us comments directly and there is ability to get the community liaisons and um, I very much hope that those of you who are participating this evening um, and who are in touch with other people in the community will spread the word about how to get as many people as possible to give us feedback between now and the end of the process. Uh, and I would also add that we recognize uh, that, uh, that some folks are not able to, uh, to join via internet. And so we're working on a setting up a phone line uh, 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 for folks to be able to have direct contact with the liaisons via phone as well. And when that is up, we will put that up. Uh, I see another raised hand. Uh, Ms. Jeanette Corbin, I'm going to ask to unmute you. Uh, you've just been asked, and you can, I believe you should be unmuted. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jeanette Corbin, and I am a longtime Malden resident um, and a single parent. Um, and I use the T as my sole mode of transportation. Um, I own a home, but I can't afford, as a single parent, I was unable to afford a car and a, a, a property. So I pur purposely bought my property on a bus line. Um, up until about a few months ago, I had two jobs. Um, I had a day job and then I worked at a hospital um, in Boston um, and I commuted to Malden Station, and then I took the green line to the hospital that I worked at. And I'm speaking for essential workers because a popular shift time, um, what they call second shift, is 3 to 11.30. So it's, it's 3 to 11, but then there's like a half an hour that they use for lunch. So if you're going to cut the tea off at 12 midnight, um, a lot of these essential workers, and we're not necessarily doctors, but we're talking some nurses, um, unit aides, those are the people that clean the rooms, environmental services, people that are um, dealing with hazardous wastes, um, cleaning up um, spills and things like that. Those, uh, those crucial essential workers that are keeping 
the hospitals clean, um, eradicating COVID-19 type of issues are not going to be able to um, get home. Um, I've worked um, the 11 o'clock shift, 11.30 shift, you know, by the time you get your um, hospital dirty clothes off in a bag, you go to your locker, you get your coat, you swipe out. By the time you're walking down to the, the, the green line, you're going to get on a train at 11.45, and if that. Um, and if they're going to ask you to stay late because they're short on staff because of um, hospital workers do get COVID-19 or somebody calls out sick, you're going to say no because you, you're not going to be able to get home. So I am imploring you to keep, um, I understand that you have to um, maybe decrease the number of trains or in, increase the frequency that they come, but I'm imploring you to keep the um, closure time for the T at one o'clock so that these people can get home. Also, some of these people may take the commuter rail. So if you're eliminating the commuter rail on the weekends, these people who may have hospital shifts and, and their shifts may include weekend days where they have to work three to 11, but they're not gonna be able to get to work. So um, I would ask you to um, reconsider that closure time and the weekend um, closure of the commuter rail because you are, uh, would be hurting people that need those, um, that the service to continue. Um, I'm also concerned um, as a woman of color also that I'm afraid that um, the people who are making these decisions may not look like me and may not even be people that ride the commuter rail or, or, or ride the buses every day or ride the, the, the trains every day. Um, I think people are looking at numbers and figures on a chart, but I don't, maybe they're not understanding um, the real reality of, of people that have to take these trains and buses every day. Um, and that is a great reason why I'm, I'm glad that this um, forum to be able to comment um, is available for the public. But um, I would just ask you to consider that you know, when you take that into consideration that the, the train needs to stay on um, until one o'clock as it is now and, you know, resulting and, and service bus lines need to stay on so that these people who are providing crucial services um, as we get to the holiday season and as, you know, it's expected that the COVID numbers increase, that they be able to get to work and get home and do what they need to do to help us um, battle the COVID-19 epidemic and so that they can feed their families um, and pay their rent um, in doing so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, again, I'd like to remind folks if you're on the phone, star nine if you'd like to make a comment. Uh, we are here until eight o'clock, so we'd like to hear from folks um, to provide us feedback and comment on the service proposals that we have shared with you today. Um, so we'll give it a minute and see if folks raise their hand. Uh, if not, we will move on to closing comments and we will be here till, it, till eight o'clock. Thank you. I see one raised hand, uh, Ms. Juliana Morris. Uh, I'm gonna ask to unmute you. Yeah, so I just wanted to add briefly um, a comment about how the information is being presented. I am concerned that it may be coming off confusing to say things like uh, of all the essential bus routes, they will be at or above service delivery policy, um, and then you know look into it more. There's still the proposed five percent average cuts, 
across those lines. And um, I'm just hoping that in your messaging to the public, you can be very clear and not be worried about the PR piece and trying to make it come off uh, as something acceptable and just and just focus on providing the straight data of what is being proposed. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to allow for an opportunity uh, for folks again to raise their hands one more time or dial star nine if you're on the phone. Uh, if not, uh, I would welcome the Secretary Pollack if she would like to make some closing remarks and uh, we will be here till eight o'clock. So I just want to thank everyone for taking time out of what I know is a very busy life that we all lead always and especially these days to take the time um, to listen to the presentation and for those of you who spoke up to, to talk to us so eloquently um, about um, your concerns. I think I would end where I started, with, which is that the T is not undertaking this process because we want to, but because we have to. Like everyone who has a household budget, you can't spend more than you, you have, and the T gets a substantial amount of its budget from the fares that the, our riders um, pay, and those fares have dried up as the ridership has dried up. And that's, that's why we're going through this exercise. Um, but it does matter that we hear from the riders and it does matter that we get your feedback on maybe which of the proposed cuts might be the most problematic or your ideas for modifying it, like the idea to maybe try to keep going till 1 a.m. but just run fewer trains. And, and I just want you to know that we are taking this process seriously. Um, I do hope and believe that we'll be able to make at least some changes before these have to get finalized. And especially for those changes that we wouldn't implement until the spring or summer of 2021, if additional durable revenue comes along or other changes happen, there will be an opportunity to make changes even after the vote in December. So thank you for um, participating this evening. Thank you for providing us with your valuable um, insights and information. And I, I will take it back and two of the four members of the Fiscal and Management Control Board um, have been listening all evening and we will, we, we hear you and we will try to take your um, comments into account. And please know that if, if we are not able to make some of the changes you're asking for now, um, it will still matter. We got this feedback because, again, we are constantly trying to adjust our service to reflect both the resources we have available and the needs of customers. And if we can't make some of the follow some of tonight's suggestions immediately, they still matter uh, because we will keep going back um, every few months and uh, assessing what the service needs of the riders are and what we can afford to provide. So thank you all. Um, please encourage others that you um, think might want to participate in the process to either contact the community liaisons, go on the website, or participate in one of the remaining meetings. Um, and everyone, um, stay safe and have a good evening. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, again, uh, Anthony had just posted, our tech support had tested, uh, uh, had put on the group chat that uh, we will be here till eight o'clock. If folks still want to raise their hands or make any additional comments, uh, we will honor the commitment to be here till eight o'clock as we have advertised. So please raise your hands until eight o'clock uh, and we will, uh, so we will uh, listen to your comments and feedback. Thank you. Angel, it may be, it may be worthwhile to also remind um, uh, participants um, that uh, if you have uh, friends or neighbors or family members who uh, for one reason or another weren't able to participate but were interested in the information presented here or at other meetings, um, they are being recorded, they are being posted on our website. And um, if, uh, if something were to come to you based on the presentation that you've seen today and, and you just thought of the comment uh, tomorrow morning or, or next week, uh, you can still uh, reach out to us with, uh, with comments at the website listed here. Um, or through our web portal on mbta.com forward slash forward your head. 
Thank you, Eric. So I moved to the uh, to to the slide. These are the uh, these are the remainder of our uh, of our public uh, public meeting sessions that uh, that we will be hosting over the uh, over the over the coming um, coming weeks. And uh, we we hope to hear from from you and and um, and, and other members of the ridership and, and public and future public meetings. Again, if folks want to make some comments, I encourage you, if you're on the phone, to dial star nine or, uh, or to ra use the raise your hand feature so that I can, uh, you can be in the queue in, uh, and I can call you to be unmuted. Again, uh, if those of you that have just joined, if you would like to make a comment, please use the uh, raise your hand feature so that I can call on you um, and unmute you. I believe someone on the chat has made a, has asked a clarifying question for the benefit of others who may not be aware. Could someone share how the November 19th official public hearing differs from all the other meetings? Uh, I could take that. Um, uh, the public hearing is legislatively required by law under Chapter 161. In addition to that, uh, the, uh, the hearing is only to take testimonials. We will not be answering uh, any clarifying questions. Those are the main differences between the official public hearing and what we're hearing here today. In addition to that, I should add that it'll have a, a system-wide point of view and not just a regional uh, view like the individual meetings we're having today. I believe I see a raised hand. I'm gonna unmute you, Mr. Pereira. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess this is my, one of my only chances to pose this question to y'all, but I'm just wondering if y'all have um, come up with or started to brainstorm new innovative ways to sort of generate that sort of income. So from my understanding, it's like a $500 million like gap in um, the MBTA's budget that was meant to come from ridership. Um, looking forward, I'm, I'm really hoping this isn't the case, but I'm sure there'll be um, other public health sort of concerns in the future. So I'm just wondering how the MBTA is sort of preparing to sort of handle that, right? Like I want this to, if we have to go through this terrible experience of like cutting um, MBTA, I'm hoping um, that you guys are looking for other sort of sustainable ways to um, maintain a, a, a decent um, amount of service, right? That um, prioritizes the health and safety of riders. Is that something that the board has thought about? Um, how, are, how are we moving to a more sustainable slash equitable public transportation um, in, in this state? So I think in, in the short run, uh, what we are, as presented earlier, we're, we're leveraging um, our, our internal uh, available um, ability to reduce uh, some operating cost spending and to redistribute some of the, uh, the capital funds that we have to support our operating service and uh, balance those two trade-offs uh, against some of the service reductions to sustain the most essential of our services in lieu of having a, uh, as you describe it, a sustainable solution for the budget gap. Um, I think as time goes on and we start to um, continue to, to, to respond and, and react to the way the COVID pandemic uh, may affect the economy uh, long term, I think we will be continuing to review our strategies uh, along these areas and, and possibly others as we may identify them. But, uh, but right now, uh, this slide uh, as part of our, our presentation, I think really addresses uh, the, the options we have before us today uh, for, the, for the short run of, of next fiscal year to, uh, to try and address the budget shortfall that, uh, that we are seeing. Thank you, Eric. Again, uh, we, uh, we still have a few minutes. If someone would like to make a, uh, an, an additional comment, uh, again, to raise your hands, turn the phone, star nine, and uh, the raise your hand feature if you would like to make a few more comments um, before we close. Again, we close in approximately two minutes.
as we come to a close tonight, again, I would like to thank everyone for the opportunity to, uh, to uh, share uh, our proposal on Forging Ahead and uh, that we welcome your feedback. And this is very helpful to us and to the senior leadership team. Again, if you, uh, there are other public meetings that we will be holding. Uh, we encourage you uh, to continue providing your feedback uh, as the public comment period closes on December 4th. You can do that by visiting mbta.com slash forging ahead. Again, mbta.com slash forging ahead uh, to provide public comment. Thank you for joining us today and uh, we hope everyone stays healthy and safe. Thank you.